I just went to my dad and said, you know, Dad, I have a, I have a problem with cocaine, and I really need help. It's never about the mistake. It's about how you come back from it. Definitely. I just remember <laughs> making a lot of mistakes and uh, and finding myself in a lot of situations that uh, I shouldn't have been in. All right. Hello. I'm super excited for today's guest because we have Mr. Yoshi Wright, um, who's a professional dancer, choreographer, commercial actor, and videographer who's toured the whole country, all over the world, and a really good friend of mine that we've I've known for a pretty long time. And um, it's super crazy because I think this is our first time actually having this conversation together. And we've known each other for quite some time. So I'm super excited to have you here, Yoshi. Thank you for coming on to the show. Awesome. Thank you so much <laughs> for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for coming, man. This is exciting. This is, uh, Maylin talks a lot about you. <laughs> so, oh my gosh, it's Yoshi. And she, she just, uh, <laughs> good things, you're, you're yeah. very you're very well admired. I, I appreciate home. that very much, that. definitely. Well, well, Yoshi actually, fun fact, was one of the first choreographers I actually learned from um, when I first started like my dance journey. Wow. That is wild. Right? And now you're getting back into it. Yeah, I am getting back into it now, which that. is crazy. <laughs> but yeah, it's been like really cool kind of seeing your like trajectory and I know like you recently like moved back to Seattle too right yes um due to the pandemic um, yeah I lived out in LA for nine years and I was um I moved out there when I was 24 and I worked out there um the entire time I was there I had a few jobs here and there I worked at Starbucks I worked at um Disneyland uh oh, wow. I did some catering and um a few other things oh Amazon Flex was one of them um but mostly just dance and uh commercial acting and modeling and other things um i wasn't too good at the other the modeling and the other <laughs> things but dance is where i was um most comfortable and um i moved back at the beginning of the pandemic because of everything that was going on and i didn't know what was going to happen there was no shows there was no live events there was nothing to do so i decided to move back and save money and um i realized at that point how much i actually really missed seattle and yeah how awesome this, this city really is yeah. So can you tell me like how you got started? Seattle is where you started, right? Right. Yes. Right. So can you tell me how you started with dance? Well, I started um, as a b-boy. I um, I actually started in jazz band. I played the alto sax. Oh, hey. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, I started, I, I was in jazz band too for a little bit. Oh, nice. What'd you play? I played a trumpet and then their second jazz band needed a trombone player. So I like opted in. I was like, I'll do it. Oh, you know, same God. thing. <laughs> Super yeah. Talented. So from, from, um, is that, uh, Treble clef to bass clef, and I didn't realize it. Oh, so you had to change everything. And I didn't know something. how to read bass clef. I played. I played yeah. by ear. Got you. <laughs> <laughs> it was like I think this is where it's at. So that's that's really cool. Jazz band. That's awesome. Right. Yeah, I loved playing the sax. Uh, I did it for five years, and then um, in the yeah in the jazz band in um, high school, I I met uh, actually was sorry eighth grade. I met Scott Lucard. I'm not sure if you remember him. Um, but he was, uh, he went to Malik Terrace High School and he was, uh, sorry, we're back at Briar Terrace, Briar Terrace Middle School. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he learned how to break dance like over the summer cool. and in between seventh and eighth grade. And I was just like, he walked into like the first day of eighth grade and just doing all these coffee grinders and stuff. And I was like, that is awesome. <laughs> like I need to learn. Yeah. So I was like, can you teach me please? And so in the five minutes in between, like the time where we would put our instruments away and we would get let out, um, we would dance and he would teach me stuff. And the very first move I ever learned was the arm wave. <laughs> hey, okay. And, uh, and then it just kind of went from there. And eventually we started our own crew, quit band and, uh, don't quit band if you're in band, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> and just kind of just went that direction. Um, throughout high school, all I cared about was b-boying. It was it. That was all I wanted to do. I wasn't the best student, but, um, it was because, um, I was just, I had other interests, I think. Mm -hmm. So um, I just remember that my goal all through high school was to get as good as I possibly could at, at b-boying. And that's all that mattered to me. And then eventually I got onto the dance team uh, at school and there was the steps, the step team and they were, they needed the b-boys to come in and learn some dancing. And I was like, all right, this should be easy. I can spin on my head. So spinning on my feet should be nothing. <laughs> I sucked. Oh. And I was just like, wow, this is actually really hard. So after high school, I got um, 
I got onto another team where they needed me as a b-boy and they actually had to come and help me um, at my own house uh, in between rehearsals because I was so bad at the choreography. But um, I realized quickly that there was more opportunities, at least for me, um, dancing um, choreography because uh, I could b-boy and that was very sought after at the time. So nice. that's kind of how I did the transition into, into the choreography world. Wow. Well, it sounded like the transition was not that easy. Uh, no, not it wasn't. It wasn't <laughs> quick either. <laughs> yeah, I feel that because I feel like sometimes, like looking at dancers, it's so easy to just be like, "Oh my god, they're so talented." Mm -hmm. But yeah. there's some people like I feel like for me, I'm not naturally gifted at dancing, and I work very, very hard to get better. And so it's kind of cool to kind of like hear that, like. Like I've seen you as like just like a really great dancer and I've learned from you for so many years that it's like, oh my God, like you struggled with dancing. Like that's crazy. <laughs> Very much. No, I, I totally relate to yeah. that. I was not naturally like gifted yeah. at it. It took a lot of work and I um, <laughs> I sucked for a long time. Yeah. So, yeah. And well, I have a lot of respect for dancers because um, I trained martial arts for 13 years, right? Oh. And and uh, one of Arthur, um, I saw him be boying and stuff. I was like, hey, show me some stuff, Arthur. <laughs> And I mean, I would train for hours, right? And yeah. I'd, I'd I'd fly through it. When he was showing me, I forgot what it was. He was it's six step or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I was sweating. <laughs> I was like, "How do you do this? You guys make this look so easy." Yeah. So like right. after that, like mm -hmm. I had mad respect for b boys and dancers because it's like you guys make this look so smooth, so easy. But when Definitely. you give it a try, you really have to put some time and effort to it. So mad respect to you guys. I yeah, I appreciate that. That's awesome. <laughs> That you uh that you got to learn from Arthur too, um, I wish I could learn from Arthur. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean a lot of people uh, I think over the years have uh, I've I think that the um, the idea is that dancing is not a real sport. Yeah, and mm -hmm. really it's one of the hardest ones out there because you have to be just as athletic as an athlete that's going you know into the NFL or the NBA or whatever, and you don't get a lot of sponsorships to do that. Um, mm -hmm. You don't get. Uh, a lot of help with it. You are expected to go out and um, sacrifice your whole life for this and live poorly and still be on top of your training, still be on top of working out on top of your dance training, still be on top of uh, your prehab and your rehab and all that stuff, um, which probably isn't going to be covered. And mm. um, and then you still have to find a way to make money while you're doing all of that, which is probably not going to be through dance um, for a lot of people. And um you know, the, all these things are working against uh, the professional dancers in the world or, or just whatever, you know, dance you might be into, uh, whatever scene you might be into. And so that when you see the people out there in, in Red Bull BC1 mm -hmm. or, you know, at the world championships for whatever, those people are working, in my opinion, I can only speak, you know, from my opinion, but they're working so much harder than the people in other sports, um, not be, not training harder, but they're just sacrificing more, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. It's it's crazy, and um, and yeah, it's it's a it's a really hard lifestyle, uh, especially after a long time. Yeah, yeah, it's not sustainable. I would say. Yeah, yeah, no, I I think like being in the dance scene, you hear a lot about how you pay more into it versus. Yeah. versus getting money out of dance mm -hmm. just because of that, right? Like, right. and the opportunities are there for dancers, but the compensation is not there yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, op the sponsorships, like you said, aren't there yet. Mm -hmm. And dancers work really hard to be a part of those opportunities and a part of like the community. And um, it's funny because I, I feel like the dance community loves to give back <laughs> and, and, kind of in the commercial industry or just like the people who pay dancers don't necessarily do that for dancers, right? right? It's more like the dance community and the dancers will do so much for the community and give back to the community. And you don't see that come back to the dancers necessarily, which saddens me because I feel like that's just, the dance community works so hard <laughs> and you see that, you know? Definitely. Yeah, um, in, in early Hollywood, there was, um, I mean, dancers were considered extras. Mm -hmm. And when you watch the old movies where like, especially like um, um, like the Mary Poppins thing where they, they're dancing on the rooftop and all that stuff, like um, it's, I mean, those people worked so hard for that and, um, and got paid almost nothing, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and so going through, you know, history in Hollywood, I mean, like 
the dancers eventually got, you know, into the union and, you know, you can be in SAG, which kind of makes sense if you are, um, SAG is the, um, is the actors union. Yeah. And so if you, if you get into that as a dan dancer, it doesn't make a lot of sense because the amount of acting jobs that there are versus the amount of, um, you know, singing jobs that there are versus the amount of, um, whatever jobs that there would be for television are all like kind of oversaturated with those things. And then dancers, you're going to see maybe, well, how often do we see a dancer on a TV show? Maybe yeah. like once in like season one for one dance scene that's like a flashback or maybe in season two they revisit it. Um, maybe they have like a cafeteria thing. You know, it's, it's something that's small. So as a dancer, the roles and the parts that you have to, um, that you have in the union and on television are limited. So when you belong to the same union as an actor, you're paying the same dues, you're paying the same everything and um, you're not getting as much out of it because the, the parts aren't there. And yeah. also you've got a bunch of people that you're going against for all these roles and it's just, um, it doesn't make sense for dancers in SAG to pay the same dues as an actor, um, especially if they're uh, only working a little bit because you can only do about four SAG jobs before you have to join. So you, mm -hmm. you can do that. And then so I, I eventually had to join for a, a television show that I was on. And things were about to be great because, um, you know, they were going to bring me on for a couple seasons. And then the pandemic hit. So. Oh, oh, no. <laughs> that so, is crazy. Mm -hmm, yeah. Yeah. And that's really interesting to kind of hear um, what happens behind the scene, like in um, the entertainment industry and like um, all of that. This is back where you were in L.A.? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So tell me more about that because it sounds like there's a lot to it that even for me, like I don't really know too much about. So what was that like for you in LA and the, your journey there in, in the entertainment industry too? Um, well, I moved out to LA uh, again when I was 24. It was 2011. And uh, I had a dance crew here. They were called Contagious Movement. And we did um, everything that you could pretty much do professionally here in Seattle. Um, music videos, commercials. Uh, we we taught at a bunch of schools. We won the competitions you that would come here. everywhere. <laughs> I literally every show I went to, every event, dance. They were literally like the it crew. They were everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I appreciate you. Um, so in 2010, my my crew they they were sitting in my garage and they told me that they wanted to go their separate directions and you know get married, have kids, go have careers and uh I was the only one that wanted to continue with it so a year later I found myself moving I was dating a girl at the time who was already moving so we moved together uh got an apartment with uh a bunch of people that she was on scholarship with in this certain program so uh I had <laughs> I lived in a house full of girls <laughs> like <laughs> when I first mo moved there and it was pretty crazy um but getting um accustomed to LA uh was a little challenging at first. I didn't. I thought there was like a lot of people that I was going to know there who had moved. I was just basically following in the footsteps of people before me who I'd seen move to LA um, and get signed and, and start working. So I thought I was going to have some connections when I got there. And as it turned out, um, those people were busy and I was kind of on my own. So uh, two weeks after I moved there, I auditioned for Disneyland, got in, I started dancing as a... Uh, <laughs> A chimney sweep from Mary Poppins. We were back on Mary Poppins now, and that is, <laughs> um, and that was fun. But it was so far. It was like, um, uh, like it took two hours to get to work. Some time from North Hollywood to um, Orange wow. County, and then sometimes it would take forty five minutes to get back because <laughs> oh, it's just all the traffic. Oh my gosh! Wow. But they didn't pay a lot, and uh, and it wasn't worth it for me to keep doing that. So I had to quit after about four months, and uh, then I got a job at um, Starbucks. And uh, and then I'm one of those people that had to eventually quit their job at Starbucks because. I had auditioned for a tour and they basically told me, uh, your flight's tomorrow. So I was like, oh my um, gosh, I, uh, have a job, but uh, you know, I went down there for dance and, um, you know, you get those jobs knowing that eventually you're going to have to quit them. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that was, it was exciting at the time. I just remember. Yeah. Um, um, sorry, I'm getting a little off track no, now. But like, yeah. What was it like? Just like having to change your schedule so much at like any given moment. It's you know? That was hard. It was, um, you, you know, you're going to go down there and you're going to just be on call at all time, no matter what. Mm -hmm. If something comes up, it's usually um, going to be last second, like the like the email that I got about my flight. So I could never, uh, I could never really commit to being at your wedding or being at your birthday mm -hmm. or things like that. Um, I missed Christmas and New Year's like four years in a row because I was working. 
So um, that type of uh, that type of lifestyle and that type of schedule, just being on call and having to mm -hmm. be ready to just drop everything and change your life, like uh, at the drop of a dime, is uh, you know it's it's very like nerve wracking almost. Mm -hmm. it's, it gives you anxiety. It gives you like I can't make plans. I can't do this. I hope I can do that. Maybe if something doesn't come up, because if something does come up you need the money, you know what I mean? So yeah. you're going to do it. And, um, and you, there's, there's quite a few times where I got a call, uh, saying, you know, you're leaving tomorrow or you're going to do this, um, rehearsal start in three days. This tour is going to be a two year contract. And you're like, Oh, I have three days to figure out like, you know, <laughs> how to, how to just pick up and leave for two years. Okay. Yeah. So when you moved to LA, were you expecting that at all? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you yeah. hope for it. <laughs> You hope that you're going to have a schedule like that and you're going to get to do those things. Yeah. And uh, so you, um, I, was, I was ready for it and, uh, and I was excited for it. But there was, there's certain times where you were traveling. Like I, when I was on um, my two-year tour through, through China with um, a Taiwanese artist uh, named Li Hong Wang, uh, there was – I mean we had one show a week and sometimes we would fly to China – for that show and then we would come back to LA and then we'd fly back to China the next week for the show and come back to LA and I was gone from you know midnight on Wednesday until Sunday um you know I would come back at like you know noon or six or whatever so I'd come back yeah and I'd be gone four days a week I'd be in LA for three days a week I'd be gone in China or, or traveling to China wow. for four days a week and that went on for months and months and months and eventually I was like I'm just gonna stay in China in between some to fly back and forth but um yeah, um, doing doing that and just having that type of schedule after a long time was just very taxing. I was always tired. Yeah. I was always sore. Yeah. I was always um, always in different time zones. In different time zones, I had on my phone <laughs> yeah. one clock that was just always on Beijing time and one that was always on oh LA time. So oh, I would wow. know. Um, and yeah, it was is you know some people work on you know bi coastal. Mm -hmm. That's what it's called, right? Where you're you're constantly back and forth between the east and west coast. Right, and right. that year, I was. You know, I don't even know what you call it. By <laughs> world, I don't know. I was literally mm -hmm. on one side of the world, the other side of the world, one side of the world, other side of the world, and uh, and never like I did the math that that year, uh, the year of two thousand eighteen. I spent a month, literally just on a plane. That's not even the including the time that I was in airports, going to and from airports, <laughs> going all that stuff. I was on a plane for an entire month, if you count the hours. Yeah. And I did that math while I was on a plane. So, oh like, my god, that's insane! It was, wow. uh, it was just a lot. Yeah. And, um, again, just it's not sustainable. No, <laughs> to do no. Stuff like that. So how how were you taking care of yourself? Like, was that really? I imagine really like stressful and really tiring. Yeah, I mean, you always have to have a toothbrush on you, and you have to have like uh, <laughs> just all your essentials on you. I'm, I got used to having everything in my backpack that I would ever need for a day trip and I would just have that on me, you know, wherever I went. Cause you had long hours and sometimes you wouldn't come home and uh, sometimes you'd miss your flight or mm -hmm. <laughs> stuff like that. So, yeah. So that's what I love about this. Cause like, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to link a lot of your social media stuff and your videos. We'll find that and we'll, we'll link that into the description and stuff. So you guys can kind of see um, how amazing Yoshi is. <laughs> and that's what, that's the thing. That's what I really love. Like, find really fascinating about this is because a lot of people just see the end result right they're going to mm -hmm. watch these videos and they're going to see how incredible you are the 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 people you've been able to dance with for where you've been but i don't think a lot of people take the time to understand the struggle that you've gone through to get to that point and in just a little bit of a snippet of la to beijing back and forth it's like oh my gosh there's a lot there's a lot that you've had to yeah. kind of like go through. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of other things that you've had to experience just to get to where you are now. True, definitely. Um, yeah, when I was uh, growing up and still kind of in my b-boying phase, like I had a huge, um, kind of after high school, I started meeting more dancers that were in the choreography scene. And a lot of them were older than me. And I found myself... Uh, getting into like drugs, alcohol, things like that. And that took over for a couple of years until uh, 20 or when, till I was 20. And uh, I went to inpatient rehab and I just remember that, um, you know, before I went, I had to go and tell everybody um, at my job that I was leaving. I had to tell my dance team that I was leaving and I had to tell them why. And, uh, you know, I think that at the time I was like, everybody's going to feel like I'm a 
weirdo for, for that. And everyone was incredibly supportive. And uh, I remember my first day uh, in inpatient rehab. I, um, and I was there by choice. I, I remember one day I went and I, I just went to my dad and said, you know, dad, I have, a, I have a problem with cocaine and I really need help. And he brought me to a place where I, would, where I had my intake and they interviewed me and thought that I would be a good candidate for inpatient rehab. So I just remember that, um, yeah, my first day uh, there was just like extremely hard. Um, and I just like found a place like away from everybody where I could just kind of like be alone and, and just cry, you know. Um, but I was there for 28 days and... Um, after about a week, I, I warmed up to the people there, and um, I eventually spent my free time in the lecture hall teaching people how to break. <laughs> nice. That is cool. <laughs> and Even there, you're still doing your thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I was one of the people would just be like, <laughs> they would call across the yard, be like, Yoshi, do a backflip. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah. Oh, my gosh. I love that because we tell our, like, our team all the time because, you know, they're going to make mistakes. Right. It's never about the mistake. It's about how you come back from it. And Definitely. Like mad respect to that, that you, yeah. it wasn't, um, um, you can kind of sh shed a little light, more light on that if you want to. Like, I'm pretty sure that wasn't an easy kind of prog like transition for you to, to kind of make for kind of, hey, I have a problem. And then you kind of take the steps to kind of mediate that. That's huge. Yeah. Um, and, you know, those, those, um, those problems didn't, end there you know i i still had uh, a huge drinking problem and a huge um um cannabis problem <laughs> uh, all through um kind of like uh, my time in la uh, there was there was times where um you know i would just be really really either hung over or i would go to an audition and I'd get a charlie horse and I'd, I'd drive back from the audition which was like an all-day thing with like thousands of people and uh i remember just getting out of my car and my my <laughs> hamstrings would just cramp up and I'd fall to the ground. And uh, this happened multiple times. It was, you know, I was really putting my body through a lot um, through, for, a, for a lot of that because you're always pushing yourself to the extreme mm -hmm. anyways. And then when you have um, a problem where you can't stop drinking, um, that really, really adds to it. And um, I just remember <laughs> making a lot of mistakes and, uh, and finding myself in a lot of situations that uh, I shouldn't have been in. And meanwhile, you're still trying to show up every day and shine like the star for like mm -hmm. whoever you're auditioning for or working for. And, uh, and again, it's just, um, for me, it was, it was hard because, uh, the entire time I was out there, uh, I never really felt like I had any close friends. Mm -hmm. And I also kind of never really felt like I was, um, bringing a lot to the table in whatever job I was doing or whatever thing that I was on. Cause everyone in LA is so amazing. There was people that I looked up to all over the place. And, um, you know, I think a lot of people will, will say, oh, you know, you're in, L you're in LA, like, did, did you, you know, mess with this person? Do you, do you like that person? And these are all people with like the million followers and things like that. And I, and I, one thing I like kind of, you know, wish that people knew more was that there's so many people in LA who I knew that had like, you know, no followers or just weren't focused on that. There were so much more inspiring to me and amazing than the, the people that had the followings and mm -hmm. um and that living in a city like that where where the people who aren't really in the spotlight are still so amazing mm -hmm. makes you feel like you know like why am i even here what am i bringing to the table and so every job that i got and every opportunity that was given to me uh was so special because of that because i always yeah. felt like i was an underdog and um and you know it's just trying to fight to just be seen yeah. So, so yeah, it was, it was, <laughs> it was educational and, um, and it's just a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, I bet. And I know like, especially like here in Seattle, that's like almost the goal is like, because I mean, you moved to LA because the, the dance scene, you kind of like did everything here in Seattle and all the opportunities here. And, um, and I mean, I saw you guys everywhere, you and your group here in Seattle. And we're kind of a smaller, tight knit like community here in Seattle. So um, there's not a lot of like the opportunities you would get mm -hmm. as you would in LA. But a lot of the dancers here, that's kind of like the goal is like they want like get really good and like 
if they want more opportunities in the dance um, world is to go to LA, right? Is to go there and kind of make a name for themselves. And I think a lot of times people romanticize that and think it's going to be, oh, this is going to be great. Like this, gonna, there's going to be a lot of opportunities, which there is, but they discount the the hardships and how hard it could be and um, how hard it is to find like a community there that you really like connect with and can really support you. Definitely. And so like, what would you say for dancers who want to go down that route? Like what advice would you have for them? Um, well, I would first say that um, just always keep learning. I think, um, and don't be afraid to try something that's out of your uh, skill level. Because I remember when I first started b-boying, I, I thought in my head, like, you have to learn all style and flavor and footwork before you can even do power. I, don't, I just thought that for some reason, like, um, and then when you, when you finally get all the, all the, all the footwork down, you start with power and then you'll start with windmills. And then after that, you got to learn flares and then you got to learn air flares. And it's like, just, just learn whatever you can, whenever you can, from whoever you can, um, because there's no stepping stones like that. You can just keep learning. Um, and if I'd known that, I think I would have uh, advanced a little faster in the beginning. So that's mm -hmm. one thing that I'd like to say. Um, the other thing I think is that if you are a professional dancer or want to be a professional dancer and you think that um, you'd like to go and do that in another city, L.A. Um, is the dance mecca of the world. It's definitely like a place to go and, and um, there's lots of opportunity there. But some other cities that might also um, be good for you is uh, New York. Of course, we all know New York. That's another place where you can go, especially if you might not see yourself fitting into the LA scene. Maybe you do more. You could see yourself doing Broadway or things like that. Mm -hmm. New York is a great place. Also, um, you know, the agencies that I'm with in uh, LA also have um, they also have branches in New York and um, where is it in Atlanta? So Atlanta, if you wanted to go there, there's a bunch of movies that are shot there. There's a bunch of artists that are from there. There's a bunch of work there as well. And they'll cover places like Miami, Nashville, and uh, a few other places around that area. So those are all cities that you can go to and work as a professional dancer as well, especially if you're one of those people that don't see yourself fitting in mm -hmm. to the L.A. scene. See, you know, that's like gold right there because yeah. I didn't know that. I, like <laughs> I, I, I am from here in Seattle and all I think is like if you want to move up and and dancing you go to LA because yeah, that's yeah. like what everybody else does <laughs> mm -hmm. so that's like really cool that like there's uh, there are other places that there are other options definitely you're not also, stuck yes also other countries too yeah. you know there's lots of work in Tokyo there's lots of work in Hong Kong there's lots of work in Mexico City you know so well. <laughs> definitely in fact a lot of uh productions in LA like will fly you to Mexico City um as kind of like a sister production city for commercials that are in America so wow. yeah yeah I didn't know that that's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you, you could, if you could yeah. go back and, and give your, your younger version of you an advice, what would you give yourself? What would you tell yourself? Uh, I would just say that um, don't be afraid to fail because you're going to. And um, I don't know if this is like super important, but I would just, if I had like, you know, myself in front of me from 10 years ago, 20 years ago, whatever, I would just say like, don't get so caught up in what other people are thinking about you mm -hmm. because um, I mean, this might sound weird, but I think a lot, in a lot of cases, people really aren't thinking about you and mm -hmm. especially they're not thinking the things you, that you think that they're thinking. Wow. So, <laughs> I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so definitely like if I had just known that a little earlier, I would have just um, been a lot less fearless in a lot of situations mm -hmm. that really weren't that serious in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, you kind of need that fearlessness with, um, especially if you're going to go into um, this industry. So I wrestled with that for a long time, even while I was still doing it. And I think that um, the pandemic gave me a lot of perspective. Um, and so that's what I would definitely say yeah. to my younger self. Did you ever see, like as a young, young Yoshi, did you ever see young Yoshi being where you are today? Like ever? <laughs> um. I, you know, it's it's something that I hoped for, it's something that I dreamed about, mm -hmm. but um, no, I don't, I don't know because um, I think that I think that I didn't even really realize it mm -hmm. until um, recently. You know, I think that one day I kind of just woke up and I realized, you know, that 
I have a lot of impact in, in this community and I have a lot of people who, who will, you know, be there for me, fight for me and support me. And those are all things that like, I don't know if I really, really realized until I kind of like got into video, to be honest. Yeah. Um, because I think that when I was a dancer and just a dancer, I was very hard on myself and uh, very competitive in a way too. Mm -hmm. Like I was just like, I got to do everything on my own. And, um, and I just kind of had a different attitude about things. So uh, yeah, I think that, that getting into video, just getting on that topic a little bit has really opened me up and, and, you know, changed my perspective on things. So to answer your question, like I, yeah, I mean, I would, I had hoped for it, but I don't yeah. even think that I realized that I was there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fully. Wow. Um, and I know you mentioned a little bit about like the video doing that for you and kind of like opening your eyes a bit. How did you get into that? Uh, well, I got into video because when I lived in LA, I had a bunch of videographer friends who uh, I would hire out for projects, videos. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to shoot something. I liked shooting dance things. I also wanted to shoot skits and um and big production things, but you know, I didn't know much about it back then, but I had a plethora of resources and friends that, that did it. And I was always kind of like in big productions too. So I, I liked it from that standpoint. I was like, uh, you know, as on camera talent. So mm -hmm. um, when I moved back uh, to Seattle, I wanted to do more of that. And I had trouble finding um, people that either I wanted to use or that even would respond to me. <laughs> so, um, uh, about six months later, I remember sitting in my room and I was trying to decide, am I going to go into real estate or am I going to like, you know, keep dancing or what am I going to do? Cause I quit dancing for six months when I moved back home. Oh wow. Yeah. There was a lot going on, but, um, I just, I didn't know the exact date, but I started videography. It was January 1st because, um, on <laughs> New Year's Eve, I was sitting there like contemplating and out of nowhere, one of my friends who I hadn't talked to in t like 15 years randomly texted me and said you are you always have been a great artist you should go into acting dancing isn't going to uh be sustainable forever and you're going to need something that just that lets you continue with that and I was always like I'd always kind of wanted to be a director I always kind of wanted to do that and I remember like back when I was dancing full-time um you're used to living broke and I just remember like <laughs> that's not a a direction that I can go because um, I don't have time and I don't have the money for it. So uh, when I got back up here, I was uh, saving my unemployment. And after that message, I, I was like, I'm going to do this. I don't care. And I spent all day, every day from the time I got up to the time I went to bed, just studying the basics of video and, and whatnot. I did that for about two and a half months. And then I got my first camera. And, um, I was so excited to, to be getting that camera and to be getting into videography because it was something that I just felt like I can still do what I'm doing. I can still, um, be creative. I can still be on that side, but it's going to be able to take me into my adult life, which I knew mm -hmm. that dancing, especially professionally was mm -hmm. not going to do. Um, so it was, it was, um, one of the best things I think that, uh, I've ever done, honestly. Wow. It just feels right and I love it and I still get to dance, I still get to teach dance. In fact, I've started a, a workshop called the Cameron Choreo Workshop, mm -hmm. which I had with um, my business partner, Isaiah Rashad. And we've done <clears throat> um, about nine sessions this year. We started in January. And we have a program where we bring in dancers who wanna dance professionally or just gain some confidence, teach them how to dance on camera, slate, perform, you know, different tips and tricks for how to, uh, you know, be engaging. And, um, and we've been going with that now for, yeah, uh, the entire year. And we're, we've got lots of plans for, for next year as well. I love that. So that we, now we have an idea of where you're kind of moving towards. That's cool. I, have, I do have a question though. I'm really curious because um, working with a lot of uh, younger individuals, right. Who are trying to find their way, their career, what they're going to do for their life and whatnot. Um, we hear a, a lot about like what parents kind of think. Where were your like what role did your parents play? Because I mean, you said you were considering like real estate mm -hmm. or like other jobs and whatnot. But you're you kept that the whole dancing and and the kind of the artistic side, and you made this your life, and you're making it happen for you. 
So I guess, and I know your mom's probably going to be listening to this because she's like your biggest fan. Yes. When we met her, she was so like, oh my gosh, do you know my son Yoshi? She was yeah. so happy. <laughs> but um, what role did your parents play in all of this? Like how did um, that play out? My dad was uh, was always there when I first started to drive me and all my friends to the Shoreline Wreck <laughs> every Friday. Uh, and then he would pick us up and um, and drop all my friends back off in each one of their houses. So that was um, – he also managed my dance team, uh, KM. Mm-hmm. When we when yeah. we got out of high school, he would kind of get – make sure that we got paid at, at schools mm-hmm. that we went to and things like that or different performances that we did. Um so he was he was supportive in the in the beginning part of my dance career and my mom, uh, she wanted to be uh, an actor. Um, she was oh. in the UW School of Drama. She was one of the first Asian American female students that uh, completed the program, and it, you know back then it just that that wasn't really feasible for her because they they're, they weren't giving parts mm-hmm. to um, Asian Americans, and so she got into real estate, which is part of the reason why I wanted to get into real estate. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but she, because of that, was so, so supportive of me during uh, my time in L.A. And um, to be honest, yeah, there was there was a few times where I, I was not doing very well. And um, she she had to help me out. And I think that, you know, definitely had, um, you know, she not done that, I, I wouldn't have been able to have a lot of the opportunities mm-hmm. out in L.A. than I did. Because there, there were a few times where she had to help me. Um, and before I would have been... A little embarrassed to um, say that, but uh, <laughs> hey, we're spilling the tea, right? So um, <laughs> tea spilled, tea spilled. Uh, but I'm going to be forever grateful f- to her for that, and you know, and piggybacking off on top of that, like uh, I think that you know, while I was out there, I saw so many people out there that were just struggling and doing this without the help of you know their parents and without the help of anybody, and they were in the same classes and the same rehearsals and the same jobs that I were on, and they were just you know, struggling just as much, if not more as me. And that's, uh, that was inspiring too. So, you know, that, that community is just full of people that are just willing to give everything, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, I think that's one of the things that I do miss about, uh, LA, to be honest, is, uh, is that mentality and that, 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 um, go-getter that drive drive. Yeah, Yeah. It's where it's honestly, um, where I learned how to grind and where I learned how to really, really, uh, focus so that's incredible um we were talking earlier you said for a little bit you had to live out of your car right oh right yeah um we actually have uh somebody who works with us worked with us for a little bit he's kind of back and forth he's literally i think he's pretty much living in his car and couch hopping just so he can dance really yeah Mm -hmm. and he's dancing in canada and just he's starting to get he's really getting into dance so he's really kind of minimalizing his life so he can pour everything into dance like um, what was that kind of experience like for you just having to kind of, I guess, minimalize things? Um, yeah, I mean, in 2016, that was actually probably one of my best years in L.A. Um, I, in the span of a couple months, I, I danced for Selena Gomez. And that was the very first um, world famous artist I'd ever danced for. Mm-hmm. Up till then, I had done some things. And, you know, it was kind of the stepping stones to get to, you know, where you really want to be as a dancer. And um, so I danced for Selena Gomez, Britney Spears, and Ariana Grande all in the same year. Um, wow. But that was also the, the same year that I uh, kind of broke up with my girlfriend at the time and I found myself uh, in my car. And um, I remember literally like I I, I – <laughs> I was living in my car, packed up everything I had, and then I got an Airbnb with one of my friends who was visiting, and I was, you know, not just staying in this Airbnb, I was living in this Airbnb, and I, um, and then my car stopped working, so this was during the time where I was dancing for Ariana, and um, so while I was dancing for Ariana, I literally had to skateboard my way to the um, train station, oh, and oh then gosh. go and get in those rehearsals, uh, you know, go rehearse with them, and then come back, and then like, you know, get back into the Airbnb and figure out where we're going to go next um, because I could only be there for a couple of days and I bounced around between, you know, a couple Airbnbs and I found myself staying with a friend um, for a week and then another friend for a month and then on someone's floor for two months and then I finally got an apartment with two guys, um, uh, yeah. Will Bell and James Marino, if you're watching. Love y'all. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, that was that was definitely a tough time. I, I, that was about six months where I was um, either – 
whatever I was doing, I still had, you know, everything that I owned in my car. I was still used to, um, to having to go there to get like my clothes and whatever. So, so um, when you say you were grinding, you were, you mm-hmm. were grinding through that. <laughs> yeah, it was That's... quite the experience. <laughs> Did you ever get to a point where you're like, this is just too much. And like, you're, you're like ready to like, oh, I'm, I'm calling it quits. I'm done. Like, where, did you ever have any of those moments? Um, there was a time where I really wanted to, well, for like, I never had plans of moving back to Seattle. I liked LA so much that I decided that I would stay there even if I stopped dancing. But mm-hmm. I do remember there was a, a time period where I was like, I don't want to keep dancing. I don't know if I like this anymore. I don't know if I can even do this anymore. Cause like I said, I was always nursing an injury or something like that. So, and I was getting a little older too. So, mm-hmm. um, uh, I'm 35 by the way. Uh, <laughs> but I do remember that there was a time where I was like, I want to go back to school. I want to do something other than dance, but I couldn't because I knew that if I was going to go back to school, I had to pay for it by dancing because that's what I did for a Mm -hmm. living. But if I kept dancing, then like I said, I couldn't commit to things like your wedding or your birthday. So how was I going to commit to school? And I just Mm -hmm. realized, or at the time, like, I'm kind of stuck like doing this. Like if I'm going to do any of this stuff, I still have to dance. I can't quit now. I have to do that to put myself through whatever I'm going to, you know, learn to get out of this. And, um, and I felt a little trapped Mm -hmm. to be honest. So I think the last year that I was dancing professionally, um, two years, uh, there was a part of me that wanted an out. So, Mm -hmm. uh, the pandemic came at just the perfect time to be honest. Yeah. That's crazy. It's, um, so like if you were to go back and knowing what you know now, how would you have done that differently in terms of like preparing yourself and transitioning out of dance and being able to create that, you know, financial stability for yourself? Because I know that with dance, that's kind of hard to come by. It's really like that's kind of like the biggest worry is like that financial stability and being able to continue what you want to do or move into something else, like you said. Right. Um, well, like I said, just never stop learning. Um, for me in particular, I didn't go to college and so I missed out on that whole opportunity. Um, and so I wish I had an an education to fall back on. That would have been very helpful. But, um, I think that just preparing yourself, one of the biggest things, um, as a dancer and as an artist and entrepreneur is branding. And I think that, you know, there was a lot of people that told me you need to get brand yourself. You need to focus on yourself. You need to start teaching. And the whole time I lived in LA, I never Mm -hmm. taught a class. I, I remember just going out there being like, I'm going to be a student, blah, blah, blah. What do I have to teach these people? So I just didn't do that. And that mindset probably stuck with me a little bit too long because I do Mm -hmm. like teaching, Mm -hmm. um, which I started back when I moved here again. Um, but I think that, you know, dancers, especially in the industry are used to being, um, told that they're, you know, not good enough or um, that they're the least important person on the set. They they certainly get paid the least out of everybody on the stage. Mm -hmm. So um, that type of mindset kind of like forces you to to believe that you don't have the right to brand yourself. You don't have the right to to, uh, talk highly of yourself because uh, again, there's so many other people always outshining you and there's so many people, you know, that you're you're the extra Mm -hmm. almost. So it's like, Who's going to follow my journey? So I would just say, like, don't be afraid to do that because everybody is going to be inspired by different people. And the people that are inspired by you are going to, you know, benefit from that in some way. And I think that the earlier that you can get a jump on that and to build something for yourself, um, the easier it's going to be to uh, have something else to fall back on and to transition into something else yeah. later. If you don't have a college education to <laughs> fall back on. Yeah. I love what you said about the the branding. And I know Ralph really likes that part because we actually talked about um, the da- uh, the dance community and how like I'm getting back into dance and um, I've been telling him more about, you know, the dance community in Seattle and what's that that's like, who are the the big names, who are like the it people. And one of the things that he, well, Ralph loves to talk business, but one of the things he saw a need for right away with just me kind of describing the dance community is that branding um, mm-hmm. of just being able to really um, 
brand yourself and really get yourself out there more and how dancers, if they are able to take advantage of that opportunity and really like brand yourself and really kind of look at it from a different perspective versus um, and not let all of the the hardships that everyone like puts on you um, from like the the scene, right? Mm-hmm. Where it's like, oh no, you can't do this or no, um, there's a lot of pressure on dancers and a lot of, um, I would say, looked down on almost. Um, so I, I could see where you're coming from of like how that could translate into kind of like how you see yourself and what you thought you could do. Mm-hmm. And um, and so I think that's like powerful that you're kind of like able to still continue on with that. That shows a lot of resilience. But um, from a business standpoint, like there's a lot of opportunity for dancers to really grow and really take it to the next level, I think, just on a business aspect, if they're able to really take advantage of like um, the the branding and the business side of it. What are your thoughts? Because I know like you had some thoughts about this. Oh, I can go on. Yeah. But like there's <laughs> like just – Right now, we're so with social media and every all the platforms that we have available. We're so yeah. fortunate, right, to be able. To, when you started, there wasn't all this stuff that was out. You oh could, no, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. I mean, so people dancers can blow up now, mm-hmm. whether it's TikTok, Instagram stories, or whatever. So there's mm-hmm. opportunities out there. But uh, speaking of branding, um, where can people find you, follow you, and follow your journey now? Got you. Um, my Instagram is just my name, Yoshi Wright. Uh, I also have uh, Yoshi Wright Productions, which is my video page. And uh, we have a camera and choreo page for our camera and choreo workshop as well. Amazing. We will link that all in the show notes. Yes. So follow Yoshi because this guy is amazing. He has been through so many things. Um, my gosh, like I am inspired, humbled, and just uh, speechless honestly just because of everything that you've kind of like your whole journey has been incredible like mm-hmm. you've you it, the ups and the downs I don't think anybody really takes time as much to recognize the down part they just see where the peaks are um and thank you so much for like being vulnerable enough to share some of that with us because mm-hmm. that's that's not easy and that's you know this is definitely some really good tea spilled so thank you so much yeah, thank you so much thank you so much for having me I really appreciate it and uh I'd love to come back and bring my mom sometimes. 